Sustainability has become an increasingly critical subject amongst governments, NGOs, industry regulators, and companies across the globe. However, the subject of marketing sustainability is often not addressed with the same level of focus or rigor as other business disciplines. Hi, I'm Connor Byrne, and you are listening or possibly watching That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you're going to hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique stories. And today I am talking to Maddie Cooper. Maddie is founder and CEO of sustainability marketing agency Flourish. Maddie has over 20 years of AGC experience as a founding partner of Brilliant Noise and formerly as chief commercial officer of iCrossing. She's designed sustainability marketing transformation programs for clients, including Nike, Allianz, and Barilla. She's completed the Cambridge University Towards Net Zero course and is an assessor for the Cambridge University Sustainable Marketing, Media, and Creative course. So when I needed to find out more about this topic, there really was only one place to go. And today we talk about sustainability marketing, what it actually means the commercial benefits of sustainable businesses with plenty of robust evidence to back it up. We talk about the challenges organizations face when trying to think about sustainability marketing, how it can be authentic and have a real impact, as well as the challenges that come with not communicating it properly, green hushing, as Maddie calls it. We look at how CMOs and marketers react to the topic of sustainability, how you can become a sustainable marketer. So much to learn here. Today is a really important topic. I hope you enjoy this episode. Maddie, thanks so much for joining me. At, that's what I call marketing. Uh, great to see you. Great to see you too. It's lovely to be here. Um, listen, tell me about, um, about Flourish. It's a new agency dedicated to the sustainability movement. Tell me more. Yes, um, so this is pretty much day one of Flourish, uh, serendipitous timing, because um, we arranged this weeks ago. But yeah, today the website's launching and uh, it's officially a new a new agency. So it's a change agency um, dedicated to sustainability marketing. Um, so Flourish is the name and the strap line is that the only business that matters is sustainable. Um, because I really believe that. We've got six and a half years till 2030. There's a hell of a lot to do to massively, massively reduce um, carbon emissions and uh, regenerate biodiversity. It's the biggest uh, ticking time bomb that humanity's ever faced. And I think we, you know, it needs all of the love and attention that it can get. So that's why I've moved to focus only on that topic. And uh, yeah, loving it so far. Early days. And something, something you're incredibly obviously passionate about is sustainability marketing. But for people who may not know um, so much about it, and I will throw myself in the middle of that as well. Um, what is sustainability marketing? So sustainability marketing is it, it's about effectively telling the stories of what an organization is doing for um, for all of its um, it, it kind of ESG initiatives, all of the things it's doing in order to be a better um, a corporate citizen for, and, and, and to make a better contribution. So most big corporations, are actually doing an awful lot. Um, they have got strong commitments um, in line with the UN, with, with the UN Paris um, Agreement, and they've got like good initiatives behind them. So most of the organisations have set really strong goals. Only about fifteen percent of those big organisations, and by that I mean like of you know, yeah. five hundred. Only about 15% of them are actually planning to increase, kind of deliver their plans at the rate that science, climate science shows that they need to. So they've all got decent plans, but they're not really ambitious enough and the, to make a difference for the sake of the planet. But more, in, uh, but then as well as that, the sustainability marketing element of it is that the ones that um, tell the stories of their change and their efforts really, really well, do brilliantly. So business at the moment is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Most leaders think they've always had the hardest time ever in business and everything. Everyone's terribly busy and it's all really, really, really difficult. At the moment, they've got a point. It's really, really <laughs> difficult. 
poly, is it permacrisis? Is it polycrisis? Is it VUCA? Of all, you know, it, it's just endless flipping complexity. Yeah. Redundancies and, and challenges absolutely everywhere. Revenues, profits, market share, all kind of plummeting because everything's really flipping difficult. <laughs> but the thing that's really interesting about sustainability is that the businesses that really prioritise sustainability are the ones that are succeeding relative to their competitors. Okay. So it's massive. Like I'm a very um, optimistic and deeply pragmatic commercial person. Yeah. So I'm not having this as some kind of like, I don't know, um, hippie-ish side move. No way. This is about like a ruthlessly commercial, pragmatic approach to make the big businesses shift to prioritise sustainability because we're not going to get there without the big businesses changing. And they need to see it as a commercial game because yeah. otherwise I'm not bother. Because everybody's yeah. obsessed with the shareholder returns, everybody's obsessed with that kind of like that cadence of proof of commercial value on a quarterly basis. But actually the ones that get it and they change to prioritise sustainability they're the ones that are outsmarting and, and outperforming the standard businesses. And I've got a kind of flurries of examples of those kinds of commercial successes that I can share. Um, because well, it's that's really what I would love. I would love to hear some of that because that, that you know, because I think you're absolutely right. Like the, the commerciality and, and in marketing, I think we probably need to do a better job of just being more commercial I think commercial marketing is, you know, is, is key. And, you know, to hear that, you know, you say that, like, you're not coming at this from a perspective of mm, this is lovely and we should do this and, you know, all, you know, I don't know, live together happily ever after. Right. But it, like it's it's important for two reasons. It's important for the future of, yes, the planet that we're on and generations to come. But it's important because it, it, it makes a commercial difference to a business. So give me some examples of businesses that you know that have, you know, engaged with this property and that are seeing the commercial returns. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so Unilever is a really good example. So um, Paul Pullman, uh, who was CEO of Unilever for 10 years, took that business from actually kind of it fallen to, I think, being in like third place relative mm -hmm. to the other FMCG uh, mega companies. And he developed the sustainable living plan which basically means the whole of the Unilever whole, the whole corporation has got sustainability um as the core it is the business strategy it's not a bolt-on it is the business strategy the outcome of that is that um their sustain their 28 sustainable living brands so that would be like uh, Ben and Jerry's, Puckety, um Purcell, there's about 28 of them um they have grown on average at 69% um yeah, 69 growth, creating 75% of the business's overall profits. So that's that's nuts. Um, and in terms of their shareholder value, um Unilever's valuation is, has grown 130% over the past 10 years, relative to Procter and Gamble at 80%, Nestle at 70%, Colgate Palm Olive at, at sort of 60%. So in terms of shareholder value, so that's the sum of the parts of the mm. profitability and the overall performance, it's huge, absolutely huge. And they've gone from having kind of lagged the, the other FMCGs to, to kind of very much um, over exceeding and, and getting back to being in that number one position. Um, Patagonia is obviously is like a golden yeah. child of sustainability, um, but their valuation has increased by 150% since 2015, while North Face has only increased by 30%. Right. So it's not like it's just this kind of, I mean, I live in Brighton and there's, uh, it's sort of very much um, kind of an alternative landscape. Patagonia and the like aren't only appealing in in, in the edges. This isn't just yeah. kind of the sidelines of, of for, in terms of citizens' demand, it's massive. Um, and then another one is IKEA valuation growth of one hundred and fifty percent compared to, you know, pick a comparison, but like John Lewis, fifty percent. Yeah. So it's um, and then you can look at that in terms of like Gallup indices of is high seventeen percent higher productivity, twenty one percent profit overall. Um, there's loads of examples of it. Mark Carney says, so former governor of the Bank of England, he said that um, 
climate change is the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. Because wow. actually, if people engage with it properly, there's so many jobs, there's so much innovation, there's so much prosperity. But for me, the most important thing is that you've got on one side, you've got all of the businesses that frankly are floundering and losing brilliant people, losing all of their, you know, their, their, their commercial success. And then on the other side, you've got the people that are prioritizing sustainability. It's nuts. Like, be the ones that be for good and thrive like it's why why ever wouldn't anyone do that yeah that's it's really answer, interesting. It, has, it has to be the strategy and then it is the commercial answer as well as the right humanity yeah i think that's interesting because like the, the the point you made about it being the strategy like it has to be core and central to the business right and where the business is going so it has to come from C ceo right but then and maybe I'm moving too fast into this point, but I do want to get to it because where does it sit within marketing? Because so that's what I find really interesting because like it's it's a business strategy. So what's the role of marketing and why should there be sustainability marketing? Does it not just sit within the ESG part of the organization? So that I think is a key part of where Flourish is going to focus is it needs to come from a CEO and like a full board down. Like yeah. That's why it's been so powerful at Unilever it, because it is sustainability is the business strategy and then it weaves through the whole of the organisation. Most of most big corporations have got their um, they've got their annual reports and they've got the sustainability reports because it's a legal obligation they have to fill them in. The ones that think of it as a box ticking exercise, meh, they don't deserve to thrive particularly, and <laughs> you know. uh, and then there's the ones that have it like with real integrity. They're actually mm. doing all of the things to make a difference. They are genuinely they are doing the right things, and for the sake of the planet just doing the right things in line with the ESG plan, like fully completing all of the sorts of CSR initiatives. That's what actually is making a real difference for the sake of the planet and humanity. So good on them. And it's great that they're doing those things. But too often, they have brilliant annual reports of their actions to communicate that action. Um, and there is stuff that they're doing. But it's on the corporate website, yeah. or it's off the main website, or even brand websites in the footer. Yeah, yeah. I think only I look at those footers because <laughs> I'm interested in what they're doing. I'd love their web, web to see their web analytics because I don't think many people other than me look at those <laughs> footers. They really don't. I mean, who 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 would? There's yeah. an example. So um, I wouldn't be mean to name names, but say as the big automotive company, luxurious automotive company, I was having a look at, and um. They say absolutely nothing about electric cars or sustainability at all, but it's automotive. And they've got massive impending targets. And right. then they've got a thing about their efforts like in a responsibility section off the footer. Now, what that company could be doing is communicating and telling those stories really brilliantly to elevate their brand and make it loved and desirable for this age of sustainability. But it's kind of it's stuck. So you get these great different brain types of leadership, and then you've got mm -hmm. all of the ESG folks. The problem is that the ESG people that have chosen to work in ESG um, or kind of the in sustainability leadership within an organisation, they're often from a scientific background, or um, they've got they've got the clout and the integrity to be leading the program, but they're yeah. really different brain types to marketers. They don't right. think marketers so they irritate each other because the sustainability folks have got all the integrity and they're doing all the right things but the marketing folks don't really understand what's being done so they're too scared to communicate it okay. because they haven't got the confidence and the clarity to communicate it it gets um it gets stuck and then they don't tell those stories so really it should sit at the ceo level and be a strategy, but get the sustainability and the marketing people to connect and work together to get then the stories out to the market. That's really interesting. I don't know if you've heard, I know of LaFawn Davis, and she's the senior vice president of, of ESG at, at Indeed. And she actually, you know, she said that the 
the the work that has to be done is the responsibility of everybody in that organization right and i i really kind of i got connected to that at the time and i remember speaking to her and saying you know like how can we do more in, mm. in marketing but then the day the day to day happened right yeah. and so how do, does it have to be then carved out into a a marketing like not a big function but like you know if you're talking about big organizations should they have you know a, a function within marketing that is responsible for telling these stories i think it needs to be a fundamental marketing capability i mean we're six and a half years to go until 2030 and the scale of the impending climate crisis this isn't a sideline it is fundamental to business and the cost of inaction is like it's bonkers compared to the cost of doing something about it now so it needs to be it needs to be a core competency and confidence level of all marketers and it, it really should be where there are genuine stories to tell for a brand let's say of indeed what, what indeed we're doing or whatever any any brand is doing yeah it's most example anyone the team the marketing team needs to really understand it in terms that they can they can process and then translate to their their audiences um but it it doesn't really work if it's a an add-on if it's a bolt-on to the brand story kind of lacks integrity yeah and there yeah. it really matters that marketers have got the confidence and conviction to be fit for purpose in this age of sustainability it's fundamental that they need to tell these stories um because younger consumers care more um there's a massive um, kind of swathe of, of data that, that more different angles that shows that um, the younger consumers will pay significantly, will definitely pay more for sustainable products and services. Um, so really, these brands, yeah, definitely. There's loads of data points um, that, that confirm that um, from all different angles. So because, so marketers need to be able to make their brands relevant for this age of sustainability. They need that future brand relevance. They've got to tell their sustainability story. So it has to be fundamental. And I think if we look at the legacy of digital transformation, all of the companies that made it fundamental to their business strategy thrived. All of the ones that had it as like a bit of a bolt on perished or like floundered around a bit. Um, but where they made it fundamental, then they did really, really well. I think there's a lot of kind of le lessons to be learned from that comparison. It's really interesting with the point you make about the young consumers willing to pay more because there's, there is evidence, you know, that um, the more kind of brand equity you have, the less price sensitivity there is around your your products and services. And so the, obviously then, sorry, I'm making a massive leap of unscientific uh, anything here but you could argue that you know that that might be aligned to sustainability adds to the brand equity which then helps you in terms of your you know ability to to increase prices or just charge a, a premium which is good commercial you know commerciality yeah. for a business yeah absolutely but i think there's um so the more the more loved and relevant a brand can be for this context of sustainability, the more they can justify charging for the brand. But also, as a kind of little bit of a, um, I suppose, antidote and reality check, there's an interesting YouGov survey I read recently, which shows that of Gen Z uh, uh, citizens, there should be citizens now, not consumers, <laughs> because we should be a bit anti-consumption, and it's more about uh, yeah citizenship. Um, so. Uh, Gen Z's will um, be, I believe it's 75% more likely to buy based on sustainability, right? whereas 49% will buy based on brand. Okay. So that's a real like provocation to all of the legacy of brand building, because if you've got some amazingly well-known brand, it's a sustainability story of another brand will trump the trump the would trump the other brand value because it's over so they, it's sort of superseding now so they're doing that research like they you know they're looking they're checking their <clears throat> it's really interesting actually we 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 were, i was looking to do something last christmas around you know the ugly christmas sweater 
trend that happens every year. Yeah. And we're going to do something around, I can't remember what it was, but it was connected to it. I remember speaking to somebody on the ESG team um, based out of Dublin. And, and his first reaction was fast fashion, though. You yeah. know, and that those jumpers are, you know, they're made, they're worn once, they're, you know, production values are low, like all the kind of things. His first reaction was that. I was like, I, that didn't even cross my mind. And that's interesting. Yeah. And I think that might go back to your point about core competencies of marketers and having this as a core competency that you you start to build out. Like, it's I find those moments funny because they're moments where I realize, oh, I, I'm missing something. You know, and you, and then I have to go and educate myself. And I love that. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Which part of this conversation is helping me do that. But how do marketers go about starting to to build that core competency? And probably maybe, you know, m- younger, newer marketers, it's, it's just part of their kind of their every day. But, you know, so, but are there things you think people should be doing as marketers kind of start to build that core competence? Yeah, I think there's, like anything, you've got to have a kind of schema um, of the foundations, um, foundational learnings that everything else can build build upon. Um, The simple, for more people need to understand the reality of the impending situation. You know, we can all see the, 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 whether it's the significance of the climate change going on in Australia and, and, you know, all of the, all of the, in, in, in so many examples throughout Europe last year, there's the feeling it. The first is feeling it in order that people could kind of mean it and start to think and behave differently. Um, so tuning into those examples and that this isn't some kind of future state that will happen in, in you know, in, in, in lesser developed countries, it, it's increasingly real. Yeah. Um, so for people to in, to understand that and and feel it more will help them take tune in and take greater action. Uh, I think there's then layers of understanding of what um, of what what matters. So things like your jumper example is perfect. I <laughs> had uh, you know one of the school emails yesterday saying, "Oh, it's dress up like a bee day on Friday." So this is my five year old. And I wanted to put my head in my hands at the thought of like, okay, so they're learning about biodiversity. Great, five, lovely. But then they want everyone to buy a load of cash from Amazon to dress up like a bee and then chuck it in the bin the next day. Like, what? So my son needed some trainers anyway because he's, he's needing So I've gotten some yellow and black striped trainers um, yeah, that yeah. have to be made from recycled materials. So I'm very smug about that. But <laughs> it's single use. And it can look like a bee, but it won't be single use. Now, that's obviously a daft example. But whether it be the jumper day or encouraging people in all in schools, in businesses everywhere, like single use is not cool. Right. Um, and it's not just the plastic water bottles. It's like it's it's in everything. So then it's the layers of understanding. So Keeping things for as long as possible really matters. So the Patagonia principle of making things that last, so buying better and having it last longer, is that fast fashion has got to stop. Mm. More expensive, higher value things. That's hard in a cost of living crisis, but from a retail perspective, just this addiction to that I shop there for, I am, new stuff, like that's got to diminish now so that people have things that that they they keep for longer. Um, And then it's things like helping them to understand that um, the sort of repairing things is is cool and it's a good thing and as a work and then denoting them or kind of handing them on to other people giving them a new lease of life is is important worst cases you would um recycle something so kind of recycling it's like a last resort um yeah just chucking everything in the recycling isn't great because it's all got to take energy in order for it to be recycled yeah yeah much better to keep the thing in the first place because it's a better thing or give it to a new person, um, or or at the la or or, or, or fi- fix it, or, or as very worst case, um, you, you, you recycle it. It, it, it. Go back. It makes me think about you know. <clears throat> Was my mother a wonderful sustainability advocate? Because we had so many hand-me-downs <laughs> from cousins, yeah. and, but like yeah. that's really interesting, isn't it? Like you know, and it's not today or yesterday, but it's not that long ago either. Where you know 
the bag of stuff would come from the older cousin or we'd be sending you know what I mean and that would come and we'd yeah. go through it and that was it that was your new that was your new clothes yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And few things being new and it, it being normalised. And I think things like Vinted are really important for that because they're making it cool. Okay. You no, know, it's, it's not. Younger generations are now seeing that buying stuff from Vinted is is desirable. Um, and there's big changes in that. I can't remember the exact statistics, but um, I'm going to be sharing articles around it. There's a there's a like a, quite a surprising percentage of people in the last um, only in 2022 bought um, secondhand tech. So the rise of Vinted is one example, but the whether it be like, um, you know, Music Magpie or um, in instances of that, where people buy um, used technology rather than leaving the old version sitting in a drawer, which most of us, you know, too many people yeah. do, um, that it's, you, you buy something that might be like a year old or something, but it's not, Again, the addiction to the new, making things last longer um, is, is much more, is, is the cooler way. There's a big campaign here. I can't remember which telco it's for, which is, you know, probably they'll be annoyed if they if they are listening to this. <laughs> They're like, but it's about, yeah, yeah, it's about recycling old mobile phones. And it's been done in a, a clever way in that it's, it's the money up front. It's like you can get money for this phone that's sitting in your drawer, wherever it is. Um, yeah. And my assumption is they're doing it for commercial reasons, you know, that they will get those phones, obviously, somehow re or upcycle them. I'm hoping they're not going into just a, a tech, you know, dumpster out the back, but like that there is some, there's some gain in it. And that's, I think, Vinted is a good example of that as well. Like, I'm definitely probably not that target audience, but I've seen their ads. Their ads, I really like their ads. So their ads do a really good job of going back to the marketing piece, like they're brand ads right they are you know they do a good job they build the brand but it's all about the sustainability story it, without it mm -hmm. being too overt either i think it's not kind of preachy which i i think probably might be quite good because that was one of the things i was i was wondering about as you were talking there is like oh is this all just purpose are we back there where you know it's you know purpose and people are a bit jaded of it possibly i think and but it feels like it it may not be it's more about um Kind of more, as you said, integrity, right? Deep commercial integrity about where a company is going. And then the, telling those stories isn't necessarily trying to be purposeful, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, I think people have sort of chucked the purpose of word around for a long time. And, and it's got to be, it's got to be emotionally resonant now for particularly younger audiences but for all of those people that have genuine climate anxiety like <laughs> climate anxiety is not some kind of silly notion it's it's real because the state of the planet is real um we're due to lose half we can't forecast to lose um half a billion uh, sorry half of global gdp um because of the um, dependency on high functioning biodiversity, like half of global GBT, G, uh, blah, 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 <laughs> GDP, um, and even like 20% of that be lost by 2050. So this is like massive in terms of the commercial impact of it. But in terms of then of the, like how do, how do brands then be relevant and appealing to citizens to make them want to buy these better products? Um, it's being, showing the stories of why their products are more relevant and sensitive to the planet that where the, the, the reality um, is in, in, impending and, and they, they you have to make a difference. So brands aren't going to be relevant for these younger audiences because climate change is the number one priority for these right. younger audiences. So I think rather than it just being like in a purposeful context, yeah. which is maybe a little bit sort of, well, arguably greenwashy. Um, yes, or, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of getting on the bandwagon for the sake of it. This is has to be like telling stories in a meaningful way because they actually, um, they're, they're doing real things and they've got genuine stories to be able to tell. And it's like that, you know, you, oh, and tell me where you're, you're, if you're making an art, you know, one of the things you look for is what's the role of the brand in this piece of communications? Like, again, that seems like really important to know, like, what is the role of this brand in 
what we're doing around our sustainability objectives because if, if that's not clear or if it's not genuine or authentic it's just going to smack of you know as you like greenwashing or whatever kind of washing you want to call it yeah 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 um all, all of the colors are perfect, perfect. <laughs> um i think this this the different what the kind of um there's multiple shades of green um and the green washing element is abhorrent like starkly greenwashing is stealing from future generations because it's trying to get on the bandwagon now and be kind of appealing to whichever demographics um but not meaning it and fundamentally if we want to exist as a civilization um, and not cause harm to significant proportions of our, our um, societies then um, they have to you have to mean it and they have to be doing the right thing so intentional greenwashing is an absolute absolute no no but something that's a, a real area where i'm going to be focusing on is like the harm of green hushing so green hushing is a really important concept for people in the sort of green in the sustainability marketing space to understand. And green hushing is really dangerous. And lots of people have said it's as dangerous as green washing. So Deborah Meaden um, and I think Mark Carney and various people have referred to it on that basis. Because the problem with green hushing is it's slowing down the climate movement um, and we haven't got any time for that. Like mm. the UN Council have said, you know, in the, with this recent IPCC report that was just out, it's like, we've got the means to reverse climate change. There's the ability to do it, but it needs radical acceleration. Like there, And yet we've got inertia within organisations because they don't quite know what to do and what to say. And that's where the greenwashing is really damaging because People are marketers usually because they haven't got the confidence in, and conviction and capabilities that we spoke of earlier. Because they haven't got those, they're so scared of being accused of greenwashing that they yeah. kind of say nothing. Right. And if they say nothing, then they're not um, accelerating the rate at which consumers choose their more sustainable products. So if a business has really invested in the innovation to create more sustainable products, if they've, if they've made all of that effort and, and investment, then they need to communicate them effectively to get citizens to buy those things more than they bought the other dirtier, carbon greedy, whatever versions. It's really, really important that they do start to um, buy those at a greater rate yeah. in order we can decarbonize and make a gentler impact on the planet. So if the stories aren't out there because yeah. of the green touching, everything is slower. The adoption of more sustainable products is slower. The commercial growth of the businesses that are trying hard but communicating badly, their success is slower, which means that they're then likely to be investing less in all of their ESG kind of initiatives in order to be better. So it's kind of like a really negative spiral that needs yeah. a rocket up it. Um, <laughs> so if they can break the green water, green hushing um, and get on with telling stories really effectively, it's absolutely what their commercial success would, would, would needs. Um, and it's definitely, definitely what the climate needs. It's so like, because, you know, you look at that and kind of go, it's almost like it becomes a self-fulfilling thing, you know, Oh, we won't tell the story. And then it was like, we look at our products that are more sustainable. They're not doing as well. Do you know what I mean? And then we're like, well, it's not commercially viable. And oh, well, let's, we'll do less and less. You know, you can see how that becomes a really dangerous spiral. Whereas if it's, we've created this product that is more sustainable, we need to invest more of our money in communicating about that product over the one that we have for, for years. You know, and it just... That's easy for me to say, right? Because, in, you know, and I know what it's like in, in a business and people are like, yeah, but we've got this short term thing. And maybe there's a there's a great case study, actually, it, nothing to do with sustainability, but it's one of the IPA effectiveness case studies from Direct Line. I think it's called, they went, when they went short, we went long. And the whole idea was, it was Mark Evans at the time. And he, when he joined the business, he said he was going to do, he knew he needed to build the brand for the long term. But he also knew that if he just came in and said, I'm going to build a brand for the long term and we're not going to worry so much about our short term, he wouldn't have lasted six months because the business was so reliant on short term. 
And so he he knew he had kept the short term machine humming and driving leads and driving sales. And then on a parallel path, almost kind of, I don't know, secret, but like a, this parallel path, he then looked at how to build the brand. And it feels like that might almost be a way where for sustainability marketing is almost create a, you know, a hub for it within your marketing organization that says like, actually, yes, this team over here is going to focus on, you know, what we do now, but this team is going to focus and build the future. And we're going to commit and dedicate budget to them to prove, setting them up for success, to prove that it can work by giving them sufficient budget, like really kind of investing in it. And larger yeah, companies yeah, really. must be doing that. Are they doing that or are they just kind of trying to wrap it up into the overall marketing? I think the ones that are doing really well um, and are reaping the rewards are going all out and they're making absolutely cool to everything, yeah. like Unilever you, you, you and whatnot. But the ones that are floundering um, are the ones that are kind of launching sustainable products, but they're launching them in a kind of a, like a bit of a meek, um, sort of poorly funded yeah. way. And then you've got, say the Unilever are thriving and enjoying all this 69% kind of growth um, and all of the profits that go with that relative to other FMCGs that are launching products, poor sustainable products, but poorly because they're so scared of doing it. They say really kind of like, where's the recycled packaging? Or like what fairly limp claims, really. Yeah. They don't say really decisive, impressive things. So then a lot of consistents are, are a bit... Um, ambivalent about whether or not it's actually any good and then yeah. they end up having to take the products off the shelves so there's quite a lot of instances of fmcgs there... who are launching sustainable products there's been all that money on an innovation all that money on half-hearted marketing only for them to be rejected from the supermarkets because they're just not they're not bold and, and good enough they're just not fully investing in them so to your point of like this may be um i don't know sort of more kind of um, innovative or um, experimental approach to the marketing. Yeah, I think that kind of um, is important, but with a view that it becomes mainstream really quickly and it doesn't yes. step yes. the bolt on. It's got to yeah. earn, the, but maybe it's got to kind of earn its way to telling the stories of like, no, actually, this is the lead way of marketing. So it can become the core, um, but you've got to, got to flip fairly quickly to it becoming that core. Well, as, and something we worked on together many years ago was was hypothesis led marketing and and yeah. testing and like a framework for that. And you can actually see how that would sit smartly within this. To your point of like, let, we're going to test it. And you know, there's a lot of these brands are in a lot of big big countries. But even if you're not a Unilever, you, you still have the ability to test in you know in a smaller way and and figure out what bits will work, and then then move it into the mainstream because you can, yeah. you know, you can suppress other things. You can, you know, figure out like testing. If you invest the time in figuring out your testing and your structure, as we did, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to see what can succeed and then accelerate it with, you know, just bigger and bigger investment. Cause I agree with you. The risk is it sits in, Oh, that's that team over there. Yeah. You know, yeah. like they have to have a proper seat at the, at the table, right? which you need probably, than senior leadership running if you were to set it up that way. And I'm not saying that's the right way, but you, know, you need senior leadership that have kind of a, a strong voice and and are given the like the investment and you know the, the ability to prove that it, it can work. And I out of the brands that you you see, and maybe not like the bigger ones, like are there are there kind of I mean we've mentioned Vinted is a is a is a good example, but are there other smaller brands that you see that are that are doing well in this space? Uh, probably. Um, I can't think of any right now. I'm sure they are. I think they have some of them. I are like, <laughs> well, I think there's lots of examples of brands that have like that are that are rising up really, mm. really quickly. So if you think of say, um, let's go back to the FMCG example of where um, where some of them just aren't going to market quickly enough. People like, say, I don't know, Beyond Meat or um, all of those kinds of brands, like alternative meat brands. Yeah. And then you think of the likes of, say, Corn or some of the incumbents. 
and then all the big FMCG groups, where they've been too, where the big FMCG groups have been too slow to get to their offers to market. Yeah. Um, because they've either been maybe a little bit complacent or a little bit inertia or just kind of not confident enough. They've been, ma- they've completely missed the trick. Like they could have had Unilever-esque growth and instead Beyond me and all of these newbies have come into the market and they've taken the claim um, or Oatly, whatever, anybody else could have had that market. But Oatly smashed it and oh bought up all of the market share because they did it boldly and quickly and they were compelling with the commercial, with the, um, with the environmental claims. Um, so they've, I think it's those ones that are the, the, the interesting examples to watch. They're the ones that have actually already Six come in as the tiny ones and have taken taken what could have been the opportunity of the of the big guys. Yeah, um, Oatly's a great club. They trust they because they make think claims that are believable. Yeah, yeah, I like I like Oatly's work and they're they're kind of structured strangely as far as I know in terms of marketing. I don't know if they've a like a traditional marketing setup with the CMO. And I, I did read something recently, I think. So they're very creative led, which is interesting because yeah. that makes them more disruptive. And maybe yeah. there's just a less of a, like they're willing to take more risks because they've in a way less to lose sometimes when you're a bigger branch, like, well, you know, a dip here is a dip. But as you say, there's so much evidence that says it's commercially not more than viable. And um, one other that struck me, and I don't know if you if it would be considered um sustainable brand but tony's chocoloni does that fit into the the category yeah, yeah. i mean amazing. partly because the product's flipping delicious delicious so that, yeah um like it's a really good product it's not a compromised rubbish version it's like yeah. it's better than, like at least as good if not better than everyone else but it's baked into that product like it's such beautiful i don't know which genius that tony's chocoloni came up with that idea but the fact that their uneven shapes yeah. because it fit, is a physical representation of the fact that the whole of that industry is un, unfairly distributed. Now, obviously, you know, if you're the family member that gets like the rubbish a little bit, then then you feel that inequality. <laughs> but, but it's beautifully designed. I think it was an in-house team that came yeah. up with that. And it was an in-house team at Oatly as well. So I think that is one thing that's to your, to your point there about the way Oatly structured. I'm pretty sure... By and large, all of Oatly's marketing is in-house. And I think it it's what that shows is they really have got the deep understanding and the confidence and conviction to be brave and bold and trust in what they say. So that's mm-hmm. certainly where I'm focusing is like building the in-house capability. Because if you've got fairly, if you've got a lack of understanding within an in-house, within a a, a brand's team and then you've got agencies that don't really get it and they've got a kind of incumbent way of thinking you're never going to make the change quickly enough yeah um and that you know that that's where tony chocolone and, and oatly stand out yeah Tony. i remember so, the... sorry no go ahead go ahead no these claims have got to be believable so i, I read a thing that i think is a 47 percent there's a study that i can i can send you the stats for but that of consumers in a a good study said that they would buy the more sustainable product on offer if they believed it, but they didn't quite believe the claims. So they would be willing to spend the extra pay more. I think it's up to, yeah, at least up to 10% more people are very happy to to spend for something more sustainable, despite the cost of living challenges. But but 47% of them said that they, they wouldn't just quite because... They couldn't, the claims just weren't credible enough. So again, like focusing on really optimizing the way that these claims show up so that they feel really believable and appealing makes all the difference to get that shift to make people go for the sustainable options. Yeah, you really have to tell the story. And like there's such, again, we know like fame and emotion do so much to grow brands. And like there's, this is all like tied to emotion. And I don't mean the emotion of fear of, you know, doom and gloom. I actually mean, like there's positive emotions here. Like I, again, the Tony Chocolone one is, is wonderful. Cause I remember getting one of the bars and showing the kids, you know, why it was, you know, designed the way it was designed. And, and now when we're in a shop, that's the bar they see, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's like, that's, I know they're not advertising to kids. I did that, but <laughs> it's like, but that's your. Well to you. So that's, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. 
but it's like your memory structures it's your brand like all the good stuff that we hear about you know if you read paul feldwick and peter field and all that stuff you can see how this sits in and go back to my earlier question like does it sit with marketing yes yeah <laughs> the because it's about be brand you know it's all about like we've had so much of the sort of I shop, therefore I am kind of, we're all built in, in that way to want nicer and better things. It's part of human mm-hmm. evolution to want nicer and, and better things and lovely experiences. But we are, we have an affinity with the brands that we choose to, to associate with and they create our identities. It's just basic, you know, basic human design. And yeah. um, for those brands that can be even more evocative and appealing for this age of sustainability, where more and more people are concerned about the planet, the future of their children, can their children have children, all of this like reality, people want brands that they can feel good about that are making the world a better place. Um, So it definitely sits within branding, but they've got to be able to talk to the sustainability folks to get the right stories out, because otherwise the stories might be a bit ropey and risk greenwashing. So they've got to, it's got to be a way of talking to each other. Oh, brilliant. Uh, so if someone's listening today and they've heard this, they're kind of going, oh, you know, I think, you know, we're not doing enough in my organization. You know, I sit in marketing. What advice would you have them to kind of grab this? Because that it feels like to me, this is an opportunity for a marketer to kind of go, wow, this, you know, this could be a huge thing for me to own. What, what advice would you have for somebody who's kind of sitting there going, what should I do now? What should I do to own this? So um, a couple of things are that um, I'm leading a new thing called Marketing Declares. Um, so I'm part of a sustainability council um, for BMO, which is the kind of, um, in, in, uh, British Institute of Media and Advertising, um, Interactive Media. And um, we're leading Marketing Declares. So you can, right now, people could look at designdeclares.com and probably by the time this podcast is out, the website will have been launched of um for marketing declares and what that is is a movement whereby everyone can sign up for saying these kind of eight quite basic pledges about the things that they will do differently so um meaning it is really important people have got to kind of understand the basics enough in order to kind of mean their intention to 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 behave slightly differently um and things like challenging the briefs questioning you know, where, what's the integrity behind the brief and what they're thinking of and what they're asking for. So just, just looking at marketing declares will be the kind of eight pillars of it. There's this massive toolkit that goes behind it that makes it really easy for people to take okay. action, whether they're within, um, when they're in a, with a client team, when they're working within an agency or just any any marketer. So look at design declares, but definitely look on and subtly sign marketing declares. Um, and the other thing that you could consider is something like, um, particularly if you can get your organisation to pay for it, the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership is a really, really good one. So they're like eight week courses and okay. um, they're really, really worth while and I last week started to become an, an assessor for the program and it's amazing the co- I did one of the co- one of the programs a couple of years ago now a more kind of high um, sort of umbrella level one but this one is specifically for marketing media and creative um, okay. the content's fantastic um, the community um, and conversation within it is absolutely fantastic and it's a really powerful way to accelerate someone's understanding of, of this context and, and how they can think and work differently so you know as a kind of taking the pledges or really getting stuck in they would be two sort of diff- you know ends of the spectrum of how to get involved amazing amazing and um, they too new to me so definitely things i'm gonna i'm gonna check out i really appreciate it maddie thanks so much for your your time today i've really enjoyed catching up with you again it's been said sort of a few years covid thrown in the middle so we're not sure how long, how long it's been um but you know obviously this is something that you're incredibly passionate about and like that just obviously comes through and so just massive um you know, best wishes with the with the new venture. I know it's not new area for you, so you've lots of depth of expertise in this. And um, yeah, I think organisations are going to be be lucky to spend time with you and you know figure out how they how they can kind of accelerate this. So um, best of luck with it. 
Thank you, Carly. It's been lovely to see you again and uh, great to have this conversation. I've just thought, actually, if anyone wants to have a look at those top tips, um, I have put them already. That manifesto, I've already put it on the website. So oh, it's flourish flourishingworld.com. And then if you just have a quick peep at the about section, um, it's got all of these kind of manifesto points that are all, all there. And then that once, as soon as it's live, that will link on to Marketing Declares where you get the full toolkit of how to take action. Amazing. I will add links into the description as well and all the different places this will show up. So, um, Maddie, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Maddie, her passion for the topic is evident, but Maddie comes at this from a really commercial perspective. She wants to provide the evidence of the commercial value of sustainable businesses and help marketing increase its involvement in communicating that for greater business impact. Maddie is leading marketingdeclares.com, a climate energy emergency movement in collaboration with their fellow members of the BIMA Sustainability Council. So check that out if you want to know more or visit flourishingworld.com. So that is it for this episode. Thanks for listening and watching to That's What I Call Marketing. If you did enjoy, please do share, add comments with your feedback. You can get in touch and find all previous episodes on that's what I call marketing.com or follow us on Instagram, that's what I call marketing, on Twitter at that's underscore marketing. And now you can watch our episodes back on YouTube. And you guessed it, that's what I call marketing. So for me, Connor Byrne, until the next episode, take care. Thank <laughs> you.